Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. So glad to see you all coming in and connecting to audio and joining us. This should be a really fun call today. So I hope you're all excited. Um, so for those of you that have been on these calls before, how we normally kick this off is if you can go ahead and open that meeting chat box. And then if you can let us know where you're calling in from, because I know we're all from all over the world, I'd love to know if you've been to one of these TNN events before. And we're interested to know if you have ever lived abroad and if so, how long did you live there or are you currently still living abroad? So um, just go ahead, jot all that down in the chat box and this will just be a great way for us to all get to know each other. So my name is Laura. I am one of the San Diego chapter leaders and one of the TNN virtual event hosts. And I also run a travel blog called Travel 80 by 80. So those are the places I hang out. You can find me at those. And before we get started, I am going to share my screen and just share with you about the Nomadic Network. So welcome. I'm sure there's some of you that are new and some of you that have been here for a while too, which is great to see so many of you. Uh, so just a little bit about TNN in case you're not familiar with it. So it was founded uh, by Nomadic Matt himself. It began at the end of 2019. So far, we've hosted over 250 virtual events, and we are now back to hosting in-person events, which has been really fun. So hopefully you've seen us talk about these or you've been to one in your city. And we also have a brand new website, which is the nomadicnetwork.com. So check that out, which I have a feeling you probably all have since you are on this call. This is just some pictures of all the fun in-person events we have had um, worldwide. So definitely check it out. It might be in a city near you or if not, just a short drive away. So we always um, have these many, many times a month. So hopefully you can join one of these. And all right, so TNN, we've got lots of different ways you can be a part of our group. So you can follow us on Instagram, on TikTok. As I mentioned, you could register for in-person events or virtual events like you all have today. We always have a variety of topics and speakers, so it's fun for whatever you're interested in. And then last year, we launched our group tours, and we had those happening continually. So check those out. We go to really fun destinations, and it's just a great way to get to know other members in the travel community. And then if you want to become even more involved, you can be a become a chapter leader in your city. And this is just a great way to get to know everyone more um, and lead your group. You'll plan in-person events and just get to know everyone um, in your area a little bit better. So a couple short, quick reminders for today. I see a lot of you that have turned your videos on, so thank you. It's always fun to interact that way, so I appreciate that. Um, but I will keep everyone muted just so we can make sure we hear our speaker. But definitely use that chat box to, to chat, ask your questions. And when you have a question, if you can just write the word question first, that way I can see it and make sure I get it answered, answered for you at the end of the call. And then... Our speakers do this out of the kindness of their hearts. So please support them, give them love, share, you know, and follow them on their social media channels, their books, um, websites, you name it. So I'll definitely drop our speakers contact info throughout um, the call, but um, definitely give them the support and love because it's so great for um, Stephen to be here with us. And then let's just have some fun and enjoy this time together. So these are always such wonderful times. Um, to be here. So I wanted to just now quickly introduce our speaker. So Stephen, he is the founding editor of the American in Paris blog. He currently lives in a small medieval town, which is just about a 45 minute train ride south of Paris. Uh, during the day, he writes for enterprise level businesses and small firms. And by night, he's running book clubs and traveling all over the world internationally. So Stephen is here today to talk to us all about moving to France and what that is like. So Stephen, welcome, and I'll let you take it over from here. Much. I'm going to try to make sure I get this presentation up correctly. Fun to see where everybody is is hailing from. I did see someone in the chat from Singapore. So I was just in Singapore last month. That's where I was born. I lived there the first nine years of my life and my mother's entire side of the family lives there. So um, nice to see Singapore represented. 
lots of Americans in here as well. And I think I saw someone who lived in France before as well. So we not everyone's a rookie about uh, about moving to France. I had I I, I was talking with Laura before the uh, the call that we I did I did a few events not quite moving to France but the idea of you know how to get visas to come to France and I did these all in 2020 um, during COVID time and they were they're really popular and I and I was really surprised at the time because I didn't really know that there were that many people I really thought you know moving to France is is a niche thing but it turned out there was a lot of interest and the fact that there are quite a few of you here today is also a testament to that so uh without further ado I think I can get started so I need to make sure I can see everything here that you all are seeing as well forgive me okay so picture what what did the pandemic allow a lot of us to do whether we wanted to or not was to take stock of our lives what we were doing the people that were in our lives the relationships we were having and when you're able to take that time to reflect there are certain questions you can ask yourself am i happy with my job am i happy where you know what i'm doing for for a daily routine but one thing that i think lingers in the background that most of us don't really ever consider is am i happy with where i live for most of human existence this hasn't really been a question because mobility hasn't been available to everybody most people they were they were born um, married died all within 30 kilometers of their home if if that and the idea of being able to live where you want to live is a really new concept and i think anthropologic or, or uh, from from a from a human studies perspective we don't really know how that's worked out in terms of what how how do people how do people exist and and move and interact when they get to choose where they want to live uh, we'd like to think yes it's entirely positive and i can certainly say i've enjoyed my journey however i want to make it clear from the outset you shouldn't beat yourself up if it's still quite scary to you even after i give you all this information even after we've talked about all your questions that it's still something that i think is difficult for any of us to do uh, so that's why i have this picture of this big dam and uh and the scariness of, of the possible plunge okay why you should move to france so here are highlights right there's a slower pace of life i don't really need to make that point clear i think especially to this community but they'll, they'll know that better food lower cost of living i think that one's maybe a bit of a surprise because people tend to associate europe with more expensive i mean certainly more expensive than living in southeast asia this isn't you know the the nomad life in chiang mai for sure but i would say there's a significant difference between the scandi life so denmark sweden finland Norway and the rest of us and I would say even there there's a difference between France and and Portugal the, I was in Portugal last month the minimum wage in Portugal is 700 euros a month and the minimum wage in France is somewhere closer to 1300 euros a month so even in France even with countries that are not that far away from each other there's pretty significant differences but the big shocker I will share with people is that you can live in Paris in your own place for about 1500 euros a month I've done it. I can walk through the numbers with anybody and you're not living with rats. It's a totally fine life. Um, and it would be really hard to consider living in any top tier city in the US for that amount of money. Access to Europe. That was something else Laura and I was Laura and I were talking about before the call. You can go to lots of places uh, fairly inexpensively. And there's a really neat um service which i don't know if there's an equivalent yet in the united states but it's called blah blah car and just hands up if you know what blah blah car is has anybody heard of that think of it as a long-range uber so for example let's say i'm in new york city and i want to go to boston i could go into this app and see if there's anybody going to boston in the next whatever my travel window is and then in the app they'll say yes i'm going to boston on wednesday at 10 o'clock I'll be driving and then it lists their characteristics like I listen to music or I don't I smoke or I don't I'm pet friendly or I'm not and and 
the way the app is configured, you really only just contribute to gas. You're not also paying them a premium. So it's a way for that person to save on gas money and maybe not be alone for the ride. And I thought America's got such a road trip culture. I don't know how this isn't a thing in our country and <laughs> the French invented it, but blah, blah, car is something that helps you get around Europe as well. Fascinating history, culture, and language. I'm saying that about France, but obviously you can uh, put that, bra that brush broadly across Europe. And then in France specifically, mountains, sea, the countryside, you have Spanish speaking mountains, you have Italian speaking mountains, you have German speaking mountains, um, you have a warm water sea, you have a cold water ocean. If there's just a lot to recommend France. So there's the, there's the PR side, the, the tourism board, uh, of Paris or the the Welcome to France Council, why you should move to France. There you go. And you'll note that up in the corner, I have a city name, Marseille. I will be just sharing some cities that I think are, are underrated. Marseille is one of them. Uh, Marseille's got a bad reputation among the French. Uh, it would be like uh, telling an American that you're going to go visit Detroit for the weekend. And you're going to look like, hmm, Detroit. Uh, why are you going, Stephen? And so among the French, Marseille still has this bad reputation, but I was there earlier this year and it's lovely, awesome, inexpensive. And there's a wonderful national park next door called uh, Le Calanque. And I showed photos to some of my French friends and they're like, is that Thailand? <laughs> they said, nope, it's, it's Marseille. It's not that far away. Why you shouldn't move to France. Uh, all of these reasons are undisputable, but they will vary per individual. So your family will tell you, hey, we're going to miss you. We're not moving to France with you. And I'm talking about obviously your extended family. Maybe you are married and you have kids. They, they might move with you, but not everyone else can. You can't bring your friends with you. That's hard. Uh, you might be in a relationship in which the, the other person is not real keen on moving to France. You might have a career that doesn't translate well here. So for example, if you're a nurse or a doctor, um, I, I'm not speaking for all of the subcategories, but as far as my friends who are in those professions, they've said that there's a level of recertification, which is a pretty high barrier to, to just coming over and working in that field here. There is a language barrier if you don't speak French. Uh, they, they speak French mostly in this country. Paris, it's gotten a lot more English friendly in the last, I would say, five years. But French is still really the language that's spoken. And culture, it's a different culture. And, and for those of you who've lived abroad, and even those of you who've traveled quite a bit, as this community knows, when you're outside of your home culture, it's just harder to to understand or process things. It doesn't mean that you can't, it's just, it's just not as natural. When you're in your home culture, in your home language, things are just easier, less stressful. And in the top left corner, you've got the city of Nantes, which Nantes is in Brittany, near the, on the west coast of France, um, very much a tech, tech hub, a university town. Everything is always going to be less expensive than Paris. So I should, it's not really much to say, yes, it's less expensive than Paris. Well, everything is less expensive than Paris, but um, Nantes uh, has a great public transportation system, great food scene, and you're out there in Brittany and Brittany is its own really special place. And then if people ask about that, we can talk about that later. Quote by Simon Sinek, if you haven't read this book, it's a great book. If you, I feel like everybody has watched his TED Talks and he he's a great, he's a great writer. And I think this is something that, I constantly stress to people who are considering not just moving to France, but, but moving abroad or even making a big decision in your life. What is your, what is your why? That why is going to sustain you through the very difficult portions of any decision. If you decide I'm going to go, I'm going to try that. I'm going to go to law school or I'm going to try this job or I'm going to make this career change, or I'm going to take on this responsibility in my community. There are moments in which it's going to be very, very difficult to you, and you're going to be able to look back and say, well, what's my why? Why am I doing this in the first place? And the stronger your why, the more likely you are to persevere. Now, it doesn't mean that you can only do something if you have an ironclad why, but it does mean that it is a more fragile decision if the why isn't ironclad. So there can be multiple whys. It's something I really encourage listing is all of the reasons that you're really attached to coming to, to France, but then put them in order. Say, all right, well, if I could only pick one, which one would it be? 
And be really clear on that because that's what you're going to be telling yourself all through this process. Top left-hand corner for this slide is Dijon. It's on my top underrated cities in France list. Dijon is in Burgundy. Burgundy is, in my opinion, the best wine region in France. I know that a lot of people will like the other region on the other side of France, uh, but that's, I think, um, I think that's the past, really. I think Burgundy, Burgundy has always been known for its wine, but in particular today, if you really like um, really interesting and a lot of biodynamic wines, you're going to find that more in Burgundy. But Dijon, just a beautiful town, very clean, great food. Of course, that, that region is known for its sausage and for its mustard. <laughs> Don't need to say that too much, but it, again, underrated. Not a lot of people there, and easy, easy rail connections also into Switzerland from there. Passport privilege. Okay, so this is a thing. Uh, I was I was in Italy a week ago, two weeks ago, and for whatever reason, in Fiumicino, they've instituted passport control, which is unusual inside Europe if you're traveling to another European Union country. So I, I can't really explain why Italy is doing this at this time. Maybe they won't do it next week. But I so I got into the very long line of, you know, non-European Union citizens. And at some point, some of the some of the immigration ladies came over and said, are there any Americans, British, Australian, et cetera? And it's like, okay, sure. Was this good? Is this bad? So I raised my hand and come, come this way. So we cut in line and we walk all the way over to the EU line. And the EU line has all of these bio, um, bio indicator barriers. So you just, you scan the passport, then they look at your face and they match it, et cetera. And I said, go here. So, okay, fine. I thought this only works for EU passports. Nope. <laughs> it's scanned. And we went through and I got stamped and I thought, okay, I've seen this work in other countries. If you've traveled to New Zealand or to some other country, Singapore has this as well, where that electronic barrier is programmed to accept certain passports. It just shows the EU ones, the EU gates are programmed to accept American, Australian, Canadian, and British passports, but they're just not advertising it because I think they want to continue to have this EU brand as powerful. But <laughs> clearly it can be bypassed when there's a long line. So that story is to go back to the idea of what, what's passport privilege. For those of you who've ever applied for a visa with a dark blue American passport, we don't get the same questions that our friends who have class B and class C passports get. Meaning an American isn't asked like, what is your purpose in coming here? Do you have enough funds? Do you plan to work here? Do you have a job back in your other country? And my friends from Brazil and South Africa and, and Venezuela, they get asked those questions and then they get denied visas even after they've asked all these really invasive questions. Americans, we just don't get asked these questions. And that doesn't just apply to short-term tourist visas. I want to explain that also applies to long-term <laughs> tourist visas. So for example, to France, I framed it as such. In a visitor visa, you're asking permission to come to France and spend money, and that France isn't going to owe you anything. Is that really a difficult request? The French don't suspect that you're going to try to come here and steal their jobs, whereas they do have that suspicion with a number of other countries. So when you understand your passport privilege, I just simply want to contextualize it. You use that to calm your fears that it's going to be really hard to come to France. It's not really hard to come to France, not just because you have privilege that you didn't ask for, but you have, but that also the way that I would consider something difficult is if it's if they're asking you to, to do things that are difficult, but at the most, you're just going to compile some paperwork. I don't really think that that's difficult. And then, so you'll see my point there. French bureaucracy is only as hard as you make it. They, they want their day to go smoothly. And so you make their day go smoothly by having everything that they ask for and a few things that they didn't ask for ready to go. And if you have that, it's not difficult. This next point is something Laura and I also talked about before, before the meeting started, which is residency equals 98% citizenship. Now, what, what do I mean by that? During COVID, I was able to come and go from France freely with no questions on a, with a residence card. So I'm not a French citizen yet. Whereas that wasn't the case for my friends in Europe or even, uh, in, sorry, in Asia and, and near Europe. So I, had a, I have a Kiwi friend who lives in Georgia, the country, and he has residence status there, but they told him you can't leave 
uh, and come back in. Only only citizens can can do that. Now, obviously, that's changed now, but during a certain period of time. But as far as everything else, my French business got bailout money the way that all the others did, um, and any other city of Paris bailout stuff. They didn't check whether I was a citizen to see whether I would get that or not. So as far as Europe goes, residency is 98% citizenship. That 2% is for those of you who are extremely politically engaged. You want to be able to vote. You want to be able to do that stuff. Okay, great. Well, you can only get that with citizenship. But residency, you can get pretty much everything else. And I think this is something that people need to be aware of. They're like, yeah, I'm going to move to France. I'm going to get French citizenship. And my question is always like, well, why do you want citizenship? Things do get more complicated once you have multiple passports. And you can get everything you want, probably, from having residence. So they have it in their head that you can, I can somehow be evicted from France. Um, and you can't be evicted if you're, if you're a citizen. And that narrative is wrong historically for a number of reasons. But I would just argue, don't worry about having to aim for citizenship. If you just like to move here, that's possible. And you can see current waiting period on visas, one to two weeks, three to four weeks tops. That was different post-COVID as they dealt with a backlog. Some of it was going out to nine or 10 weeks. But generally speaking, especially now with how things have been streamlined, it's not going to take very long. The town that's in the top left-hand corner of this slide is Amiens, which is in the north. And yeah. it, it's somewhat of a little Venice. And it has the largest cathedral, largest, oldest, most intact cathedral in France. And just a really lovely town. Someone had been telling me about it for a long time. I finally had a chance to go there early this year, and I love it. Can't say enough about it. Can I work remotely in France? Hmm. So go to any website or go to any forum or go to any Facebook group, and you are going to find heated discussions on this topic. Heated. <laughs> and I don't know why. I don't know why people who are not working for the French government, they're just simply, you know, a Kevin or Karen, like on their keyboard, and they need to tell you what's up, even though they don't have any stake in your personal life. I don't know why they're so um, heated about this, but there's no reason to be. The fact of the matter is that most countries, and I'm excluding here countries like Estonia or Croatia or other countries who very recently put in laws that deal with digital matters. Most countries don't have, uh, have laws on the books yet that really account for remote work and the taxation implications of remote work. The, the the visa classification that I'm on here in France, the kind of work I do ha is governed by laws that were put on the books by uh, King Louis XIV. So, so you can see, all right, let me get this straight. You think that laws put together by Louis XIV outlaw remote work? Probably not. The other part of it is it just flies in the face of my own experience. I've helped people get visas in which part of their application is explaining how they have the money to be in France. And they say, I have a remote job. And the employer signs the letter saying, yes, so-and-so is a remote worker for us. And then the French government approves their application. So I'd have, to, I'd have to find that the government is in contradiction with each other. Now, I would argue that that's not out of the question. Hypothetically, branches of government can disagree with each other and then it's finally resolved. But at the moment, I've never heard of anyone being kicked out of France for working remotely. I have helped people both before 2020 and after 2020 um, apply and get a visa, stating to the French government that they're going to be working remotely. And I would argue more broadly, most countries don't have an answer for how rem remote work situations are, are tracked. So for example, let's say I have a South African company I'm on a video call consulting with a client who's living in Colombia. Um, and while I take that call, I'm in Australia. There are different legal arguments you could make for who gets the revenue from that transaction. If I'm charging for that consultation, does South Africa get it? Does, does Colombia get it? Does Australia get it? And realistically, the question is always going to be about taxation. Right. So if the idea is I'm trying to avoid taxes, well, you're going to get caught. 
But if you get a question from one of the tax agencies, whether it's the French tax agency or the US tax agency, and you show a narrative in which you say, oh, well, look, I've been paying taxes, then they can go to the other agency and deal with it. Now, in the case of France and the US, we have a tax treaty. So that's dealt with automatically. But in other cases, you'd have to consult with your accountant. But as I say, it's about the narrative. So as long as that income is being declared somewhere and taxes are being paid on it somewhere, I think that is the ultimate question that underlies this big resistance from people who are saying, no, you can't work remotely in France. It's illegal, blah, blah, you're going to go to jail. All of that's not true. You can't go to jail for working remotely. But um, I've never heard yet. And it, I'm happy to be corrected. So this is still, as I say, developing. We're, we're in a time in which the internet and the nature of work is changing. And so that will be reflected in the laws, I think, in a lagging way. It's not going to be immediately corrected. But at some point in the future, remote work will be dealt with in French law. But at the moment, it isn't. So I, I understand why people can interpret the stricter way, but it flies in the face of my own experience. Top left-hand corner is Morzine. If you're a skiing person, Morzine is a dreamy place for you to go. It's close enough to the Swiss border that you can enter a ski lift in France and ski down into Switzerland. I stayed in Morzine for a month a few years ago when I was trying to improve my French. There's an amazing school there called Alpine French School. And you, you can arrange your classes however you want, and then you ski when you're not in class. So you can go skiing in the morning, have class, ski in the afternoon, have class, however you want to do it. And what was funny was at the end, so I did this for 30 days. And I don't know if you've ever watched, there's an episode of The Simpsons in the very first season in which Bart is like kidnapped to you know work as slave labor in this like French prison camp. And at the end of the episode, he tries to speak English, but all that comes out is French in these subtitles. And so I thought I had in my mind, like, I'm going to come out of this month in the mountains and I'm going to come out. And yes, 100 percent. My French went from I call that that famous dotted line. I'm afraid and I'm not afraid. And this is true in any language. Am I afraid of opening my mouth or am I not afraid? And I crossed that magic line of I'm not afraid anymore. So that was really positive. But I also got really good at skiing. So, of course, you don't think about it, but yeah, if you're going to spend 30 days skiing almost all of those days, you're going to get better. So that was a really fun side effect. But um, I also had, I had fellow classmates in there who were spending more time skiing than they were on their French. So there's that temptation as well. Uh, but Morzine is a wonderful place for skiing and learning French. Can I get hired in France? No. Um, but seriously, unless you're really special and you can convince a company to spend $10,000 to sponsor you on a work visa, the answer is still no. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm not saying you don't know somebody who had, who's happened. And, and probably the easiest way in the last five or 10 years has been you tra transferring with a multinational. So let's so say you work with Deloitte, or I, I know someone who worked for Match.com and she got transferred over. But even then, those transfers were highly competitive and limited. So you have to keep in mind, think about it the way that the company would think about it. What special skills do you possess that that no one else in the European Union possesses, such that a company is going to spend extra money to hire you? Uh, you can see if I'm trying to drive this home, please see answers one and two. Um, now, I'll give you an example of how this happened for me in a country that's even more difficult to hire than France in Switzerland. I've gotten two work permits to work in Switzerland before. And someone had reached out to me a short time after I'd moved to France. I'd sold a test prep company. So in my past life, I used to help students with the ACT, SAT, GMAT, GRE, LSAT, all that jazz. So it was there on my LinkedIn and someone had reached, reached out and said, would you like to come work in Switzerland for the summer? And I didn't know at the time, I thought, oh, Switzerland, that sounds nice. But the answer, folks, in life, if anyone ever asks you that question, the answer is yes, right? Always, always yes. Switzerland is one of my favorite places on earth. And I, uh, I, I said, okay, sure, I'll take this interview. But, but my first question was like, well, how did you even get my name? He's like, well, I did a search in LinkedIn for these keywords, and you're the only person who showed up. <laughs> and so Swiss law, somewhat like EU law, requires that when you put a job posting, to hire a foreign national, 
no one has had to respond, no one has responded to the ad. So sometimes what this means is if an employer really wants you, they will create a job description somewhat catered to you that will be difficult for other people to replicate. So if you find someone who really wants you in the European Union, just collude with them to create a job description that you are likely going to be able to meet and no one else will. So for example, the person who hired me for that project in Switzerland, she herself had gotten work with the Swiss company because they catered to her background and put together a really unusual job description that surprisingly no one in Switzerland uh, responded to. So same thing, the only reason I got my Swiss work permit was no one in the entire country of Switzerland responded to that job ad credibly within a six week time period. So that's the short, can you get hired in France? Probably not. Uh, so I'm leaving that, I've told you that story to give you a little bit of an opening as to how that can happen. Top left-hand corner is Toulouse. Toulouse is in the South. It's the home of Airbus. I say it's like nerd town because there's a lot of smart people there, but it's also a university town. Very clean, very pleasant, great food down there as well. See these recurring themes all throughout France. Like I'm always saying the same things, but I will say life in the south of France is entirely different from, from here in the north. That You can tell, although it is the time of year as well, it's a bit gloomier, but in the south, it's always sunnier. It's always warmer different types of food down there. Obviously they use a lot more olive oil, a lot more tomatoes in that part of France uh, than they, they, they do up here. Uh, but Toulouse, really wonderful town. And it's not underrated, everybody knows about it. Visa types that don't rely on others. And so when I mean don't rely on others, it, it means you don't have to have a significant other, you don't have to have a job offer, you don't have to be coming over on some diplomatic reason. All of those, you're going to have help. If you have a French significant other, they will be, he or she is going to be able to help you. But these visa types apply to everybody where they just rely on you. They're, they're, they don't apply to anyone else. So in the really, really easy category, there's nothing easier than the au pair visa. It's really, really simple. However, there is an age cap. So 28, I remember replying to somebody who'd emailed said, well, you know, I've got a bunch of grandma experience now. And I said, that's awesome. And I'm sure you're right. But in France, you've aged out, unfortunately. So if you're over 28, you can't apply for the au pair visa. However, there is no age cap on a student visa. And the student visa even comes with a right to work. You can work up to 20 or 24 hours a week, I think, um, legally. And then, as I say, the visitor visa, which you can work remotely, you can live off your savings, you can live off your 401k, whatever you'd like to do. Those are really, really easy. In each of those cases, there is one primary proof that is going to make or break your application with the au pair visa. Do you have a contract with family, your student visa, copy of your enrollment, and the visitor visa, copy of your bank statement? That's really it. Those, that's the make or break of your visa application. The moderately easy, I listed as profession libérale, which is the visa classification I have, and passeport talent. And those would be the, the the gap between, let's say, someone who wants to have a freelancing business with an income cap of, let's say, 75, 85,000, and talent, which is maybe I want to open a, an Airbnb business, a bed and breakfast, something that's going to require anywhere between 30 and 300,000 euros in investment. That's that route as well. Top left hand corner, Annecy, which is on the Swiss border, absolutely gorgeous. One of the most beautiful places in France. Can't say, can't say much more than that. Book giveaway trivia. So I'd mentioned in the description for the event that I would, um, I would be giving away some books. So this is on, this is on the honor system. Okay. So the no searching on the internet. This is just you answering when I ask, but I've been giving you a bit of help throughout here by, by naming some, but when I say go, just type and um, and Laura will keep track in the chat uh, as to who does this. But I need you to name 12 cities in France. So type in 12 cities in France and those who, who get it. I won't just give away one, but I'll give away a few digital copies of the book uh, and I'll get, I'll get to you um, after the event. Okay, so 12 cities in France, go for it. We'll be moving on. So there's another city, if you didn't name one, Montpellier, top left-hand corner. Um, another city in the south of France. Um, 
really beautiful architecturally, also a student town, um, really close to the French Riviera. Moving to France, where do you want to live? So part of the reason I've been sharing all these cities, even though my website is called The American in Paris, and I have a great love for Paris, is I feel like everyone knows about Paris. I don't really need to pitch Paris. But I do want to point out, you don't need to feel like Paris is your place for coming to France. There are so many different ways that you could make a life in France. And that's something you really need to think about and try to reach out beyond the the brand names, the, the places that get all the recognition. And that would be considering a scouting trip, like come out, visit different places. When do you want to move? So I really underline the fact that, and I, when I'm talking about this, I do have an exciting new book that just got published, uh, 29 Days to France, in which I talk about some of these steps. And part of that is you don't want to be moving out of your apartment and moving out of your out of the country on the same day. You want to give yourself some space, not only because I think that practically allows you to see what you really need and what you're missing, but it also saves you some money. It gives you some time to couch surf with friends and loved ones to spend that time with them that you're not going to have with them now that you're moving away. So I tend to recommend 90 days. So consider moving out of your apartment with 90 days, 60 days, 30 days to go. And with some of your stuff in storage, you're going to be living with what you're going to have in France. And that'll give you an opportunity to realize, oh, I forgot about that one thing. And then you can go to your storage and go get it. Oh, I forgot about this, or I need to buy this. Or, or you might realize, wow, I don't need all of this and leave it. And to give you some perspective, I lived, uh, my I, the last uh, apartment I lived in in the United States was 2,400 square feet. Uh, plenty of room. I think this is the challenge for us as Americans. We always have room for crap. So we just keep buying it, whether we're not even thinking about it. So long before Marie Kondo came into my life, I had all this crap. And then I moved my first apartment in Paris was, this is not a typo, <laughs> 67 square feet, right? That was my first apartment. And I, in a certain sense, I wish this for everybody. I wish that people could live in 67 square feet, smaller than a tiny home, so they could realize how much they really need to live and what is superfluous and what is stuff that we're never going to see or even think about. And I didn't, when I moved to France, I didn't take the time because I knew it would be emotionally and uh, emotionally difficult and it would take a lot of time to go through all my crap. But on the flip side, when I was away from it for years at a time, it made it that much easier for me to, when I visited the United States to see my family, to get rid of stuff. Um, so if you do have time and the emotional energy to deal with it, I would encourage you to deal with it before you move. But I promise you, it will be very, very easy once you do move. Um, we we all have too much crap. I mean, that is just that's just the reality of things. So you can see I have some other tips. When will you sell your vehicle? Are you going to store your stuff in storage? Is, do you have a friend who's kind enough to let you put stuff in a basement? Um, setting aside funds, no matter how inexpensive it is to live in Europe comparatively, as I've already said, there's always going to be things that come up. So whatever you set aside, then add another 50% as just extra. Maybe there's an event that comes up or you want to get away for a weekend and you'll have that money because you planned for it. The last one, buy a one-way ticket. And I say this because I bought mine so I came back from, a, I took a one month trip in Australia at the end of 2012. I came back in January and I bought a one-way ticket for December of that year. December of 2013 was when I was going to move to France. So that means I'm coming up on my, starting my 10th year in France. And it was, it was about the middle of the year, it was June. And I thought to myself, oh, I wish I had a little bit more time. But the thing is, you're always going to tell yourself that. You're always going to wish you had a little bit more time. No one's ever going to say, oh, I, 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 I wish I had less time. So having that deadline of December the 13th, that's my one-way ticket I'm leaving, it meant that I had to get things done. And by buying that one-way ticket and forcing that deadline on myself, I found I was really able to move through things in a way that I've I found with others who, who haven't, that they've really struggled. So I just want to recommend that as a hack buy a one-way ticket that is going to help you. All right, questions.
That was amazing. Okay. And first of all, I have to say, I'm so impressed with everyone who wrote all their 12 cities so quickly. That wasn't, I don't know, there were a lot of you, at least 20 of you that did that. So very impressive. Um, but Stephen, oh my goodness, such a great presentation. I, you really broke it down. Um, hopefully everyone has some good ideas of what to expect, get in the right mindset before you do move there. So um, thank you for that. It was wonderful. Uh, we do have a lot of questions that came in. The first two that I had, you actually just answered. It was in terms of housing and moving all your stuff there. Obviously, it sounds like you kept some of it here. So did you just keep it at your family's home or where did you keep those belongings? That no, you my, my, my sisters really just, my sisters were not on the France train in the first place, right? So they were really upset that I was leaving all my cute nieces and nephews. So they weren't, they weren't necessarily encouraged, but I did have a friend who let me stay, um, who let me put stuff in a basement. Um, but on the, on that family side, I will say that when I came back a year later, 20 pounds lighter and totally zenned out, my sisters thought, oh, maybe there's something to this whole France thing. So the resistance faded after that first year, but let's say right up until I left, they were not happy with my decision. That makes sense. Okay. So I know you said you bought this one-way ticket. So did you have any idea in your mind how long you would be there? One of the questions was if you did a trial run um, before you moved, but I know you just bought this one-way ticket. So I'm just curious what you're, you were thinking in your mind around time frame, or if you're just going for it and seeing what happened. Um, among my friends, I am probably the person who lived in France the least before moving. Almost all of my friends, they either did a semester abroad in France, or they lived there for like a month during the summer. I spent a total of eight days in Paris across three different trips before moving to France. And that's how I am as an individual. I'm very much a gut player. Like I, I feel something and then I make a decision based on that. And so I felt enough. But I would recommend to most people, I'm, I don't think my experience is replicatable. I think you should come for a week or two, experience it, get in the rhythms, do a scouting trip. Um, I just happened to be in a place and a time in my life in which I was able to do that. And I told everybody I'm going for a year because I literally did not know how to renew a visa. I knew I had to figure out how to get one. And that's how the whole blog started was there was no information in 2012 on the internet about how to get a visa for France. There's tons of information now, but back then there wasn't any. So my thought was, I'm going to write down everything, take photos, upload this so other people can get help. And what ended up happening was people started to say, hey, I printed out your article and I got my visa and I, I can I buy you a coffee when I get to Paris? I'm like, oh, wow, free coffee. Awesome. And then it led to, can you help me with my application? I'll pay you. I'm like, oh, money. Awesome. Um, and then that led to me creating video courses, eventually recently writing the book. But it was simply a, a lack of information. And so don't feel constrained like I'm going to move to France for forever. Um, tell everybody you're going to try it for a year. And really, maybe it'll only be a year for you. Yeah, such a good point. You never know. I love how it all played out for you, though. Just kind of kept snowballing into this beautiful effect, right? Now you've been there for 10 years. It's incredible. Um, okay, another question we had in regards to housing was any, do you have any recommended websites or resources for short and long-term housing? One person did write in the chat, and I'm going to probably butcher this because I don't speak French, is they said it's like a French version of Craigslist called Le Bon Coin. Le bon? <laughs> Yeah, you could say Le Bon, Le bon Coin. That's fine. It's Le Bon Coin. Uh, there there's go. also <laughs> C'est Logier. Uh, there's quite a few. In fact, if you go to the American in Paris and just type in apartments, you'll find there's a few articles we've written. From, not that I've written, but other people have written because they've recently gotten an apartment and they, they share with you how they went through it and the, the resources. But there's lots of different places where you can you can get stuff. And I always say getting an apartment in Paris is much harder than anywhere else in France. Anywhere else in France, frankly, it's really easy. But if you've ever lived in New York or San Francisco, where you've got a lot of people competing for not a lot of spots, Paris is like that. So beware. Okay, interesting. Oh, and real quick, I'll have you stop sharing your screen just so we can see everyone's faces in the boxes too. Um, and then, yeah, that's perfect. And then, okay, we just got another question and actually around housing as well. So I'll focus on that. Um, it's from Jim. And when... When do you find a place to live in the, well, let me read this. When do you find a place to live in the U.S. before you leave or after arriving? If the latter, how much time did it take you um, away from working to make a living? So I guess, okay, two parts of that. 
sorry, I was reading it before I put it into my words. So how long did it take you to find a place to live when you moved to France? And then after you were living there, how long did it take you to actually make a living to be able to continue living there? Okay. Um, so the first part of the question is, you can't move to France without an address, not legally, right? So if you're going to get a visa, you're going to have to give them an address. In my case, it was the address of an Airbnb, right? I talked to the lady uh, at that time. I said, hey, I, I don't know where I'm going to live long term, but are you okay with me living here month to month, maybe as long as a year? And she said, yes. And after about three months with her, I was able to find an apartment and move on and change my address with the French government. But the French government, while they're happy for you to present them with a one-year lease, that's not required for your visa. What's required is an address, a legal address. And, and that can mean a friend of yours who's willing to take your mail. But um, I think one of my friends, the person, one of my friends who lives in Annecy, he just gave a hotel address. Uh, so what's important is that once you find your permanent address that you communicate that to the French government, because that's going to be part of wherever that address is, is where you're going to go for your visa renewal. Um, and if you don't change it in time, then you're going to be convoked to go back to where your original address was, which may not be where you're living. The second question about like, well, whether it takes, uh, what does it take to make a living? Well, as I said, if you work remotely, there's no transition. If you're retired, there's no transition. If you're a student, you can have a job. The question is, I think what you're asking is, if I wanted to start a business in France, well, that's up to you, right? Uh, depending on how in demand your business is uh, will depend on how long it takes you. But I would argue that the general rule is the same in France as it is anywhere else. The thousand day rule, three to five years is what it takes to take a business from zero to replacing your full-time income. So that's no different. Now, France is the most anti-business country in Europe. I always tell people that I did not come here to start a business. I came here because I love France. I happen to be able to start businesses. And, um, but that's not why I'm here. <laughs> uh, France is, they make it very difficult for you to own a business. President Macron has made this slightly better, but I don't recommend, if you want to come to Europe to start a business, the countries you want to go to are the Netherlands or Croatia or or Germany, they're not France. France does not make the top 10. The top 10. I don't even, it makes the bottom 10 of lists, um, business friendly countries. It's not business friendly. Okay. Good to know. That's good. Just good, honest opinion there as well. So thank you. All right. We actually have a lot of questions coming in right now on visa. I will try to get to all of those in residency. Um, but real quick, earlier on, we got a question regarding around health insurance. Um, Madeline was curious if you can talk a little bit about health insurance situation for folks who move there from non-EU countries? Well, the, there's not a distinction. So you have to realize the American system, as, as much as it gets a very bad rap, I don't think it's nearly as bad as it, it could be. Uh, I, I left the United States in 2012, so I'd experienced American health care for, for many, many years before the Obamacare laws came in. So I, I can't speak to what has happened since. Obviously, things are very different post-Obamacare. But the, it's a small country. So France, it's smaller than Texas. So when you think about healthcare, you have to, first of all, change your scale of thinking, I'm thinking about the United States and just basically think about a state. So think about Massachusetts or California. So how would this state handle healthcare? And so with France, there's not a distinction between uh, you're an EU citizen or you're not. There's just, do I have insurance or do I not? And is that insurance a state sponsored insurance, or is it private pay? So when you go to the doctor, if you go to the doctor in France, if you have your healthcare card, um, I wonder if I can easily grab it, you're just going to present it um, when you're there. And if you don't, then you're just going to pay full price. So there's your little healthcare card. You give it to them, they scan it, and you pay at the point of service. So it's not a zero dollar. So even though I'm in the healthcare system, if I go to the dentist, for example, I pay $60 for cleaning of my teeth. And then a few days later, $48 is going to show up in my bank account because I'm the French government's paying 70%. There's also private pay mutuals in which you can then um, have that difference topped up. So you'll get another $12 back from your private insurance. This only makes sense for people who go to the doctor. 
I'm the person who goes to the doctor every three, five, seven years, right? Like I need to be bleeding out like to go to the doctor. Um, but for other people who really love going to the doctor frequently, getting that private mutual insurance is fine. For those of you who are coming over first time, you're not going to be eligible for this right away. You will be after a few months, but that just means you're going to have private insurance, um, Cigna Global. There's a lot of other companies that offer that. And that's what you're going to need for your visa application, because you're going to need to show that you have health insurance out uh, that covers you in France. However, you obviously can't be covered in France until you're a French resident. So there's an article on the website explaining how you then can move on to the French healthcare system once you're here. But effectively speaking, that just means that you're going to be on the French health. There's not like separate health care for aliens and for citizens. It's the same doctor. It's just a question of how much you're going to pay and how much you're going to get back. Like there's no like, oh, you're not a French citizen. You can't get service here. You know? And it's not that expensive. I think this is a strange thing. Americans will always going to do a double take when we try to buy drugs in France. Like you go and say, can I get the equivalent of ibuprofen? And they're like, yeah, it's 80 cents. And they'll hand you a package. <laughs> like this, this can't be right. Like I said, I, I said I needed a package of however many. Um, so I think you'll just get a bit of sticker shock when it comes to prescription drugs. It's just really inexpensive. And they're not always covered by the medical plan. So even if you're on the French healthcare insurance, like not all drugs are covered. However, you're never going to get the kind of sticker shock that you would in the U.S. with prescription drugs. Okay. Wow. That was really informative. Thank you. Um, one question just came through as you were talking about that. Do you know, can you use Medicare as your U.S. insurance while there? Uh, does Medicare have a rider that covers you while you're permanently living abroad versus while you're visiting? I don't think so. I do know that, for example, you I, I didn't know this before I moved to France. Do you know you can get your social security directly deposited into your French bank account? That's possible. But I don't know that you can get Medicare coverage. I think it's very much a US-based thing. And even the, the reciprocal idea, can my French insurance cover me in the United States? I have a friend of mine who got ill while she was visiting her family and she put in a claim into French insurance for the medical coverage she got in the U.S. And it's been nine months and she still hasn't heard back from the French company. So the other way going, it also seems to be questionable. OK, perfect. Yeah. And someone just actually wrote in saying that, no, it doesn't cover you. So I think you guys are right on with that. Um, OK, so we're going to switch over now to residency visas because we have a lot of questions. Hopefully I answer all of yours. But um we got a couple of just like, what was the path that you took to become a resident? You know, how long did it actually take? Um, let, let's start with that. And then I'll, I'll go through all the other questions. Sure. So as I said, I didn't know anything about anything when I when I came. And so I, I looked through all the visa classifications. I didn't want to be a student. I have an MBA. I'm like done with college forever. Like I, I don't want to go to school. I was too old to be an au pair. That path was closed to me tragically. And so I opted for the visitor visa and the visitor visa is renewable, like basically forever. You can just keep renewing that every year. And after you've renewed it four times, so you've been here at least five years, you're eligible at that time to apply for what is called a 10 year card. Um, and the only difference between all of the renewals you've done up to that point and the 10 year card will be a language requirement. And it's A2. For those of you who are familiar with it goes A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. For context, B1, B2 is going to be required for most jobs in which French is the dominant language. So give you context, A1 is like, comment allez-vous? Je, je m'appelle Steven, right? A2 is the only requirement for this 10-year card. So it's going to be questions like, tell me about your family. Where were you born? It's not difficult. So do not cry about... Uh, I can't pass this language test. Um, so that's really, if you want to get a 10-year resident card, you just need to renew your visitor visa four times. And then you don't go to immigration again for 10 years. And then you can renew that 10-year card again in 10 years. Um, for me, about a year into my visitor visa, I thought, well, I would like to maybe have a business here. I don't want to be in a place where I can't do something financially in France. I wasn't working a remote job. I wasn't interested in a remote job at the time. 
And so it came to me through different research, talking to people. That's what's different too. When you're here in France, you have access to so many more resources than when you're just searching on the internet. You make friends, you learn things. And so I found out about Profession Liberal, which is what, as I said, it's a effectively a freelancer visa. You can start a sole proprietorship. And that's what I did. And you get a one-year card to start. And if at the end of that year, you show that your business is viable, they'll give you a four-year card. And I just renewed my four-year card earlier this year. Um, and I'm putting in my papers for citizenship um, this month. Just to give you some context, I did the thing that I argued against earlier in my presentation. I, I was really like, oh, I have to get citizenship as soon as possible. As soon as that five-year mark hits, I'm going to put in my paperwork. And here it is. I've been eligible to apply for four years. And I'm only applying now because there's no rush. I have everything I want with residency. I can live here legally. I can come and go. I'm not interested in voting. So that part doesn't excite me. And so now I am finally applying for citizenship. And you'll find that among a lot of people. They just finally put the paperwork together. But they're not worried or rushed. And that's something I really want to communicate. Do not feel like you have to get citizenship in order to, quote, unquote, guarantee your stay in France. Residents have that right. Now, whether if you get arrested, that's on you. I can't, I can't do anything about that. But if you keep your nose clean, it shouldn't be a problem for you just as a resident. So I then made a switch from visitor after my first renewal. So you cannot change from visitor on your first renewal. You, if you come as a visitor, you must renew at least one time. So I found out in my journey as like, that, oh, I, I, I'd already wanted to switch, but I found out I couldn't switch this year. I had to wait. So that allowed me to just take a little bit more time to plan. And when it came time for my second renewal of my visitor, I just made an application to change. I then made my case for Prof. Lieb and they changed me over. And that's what I've been on ever since. And then when, once you become a citizen, then immigration status doesn't matter anymore. So. Okay. Makes sense. And how, how long is that first is it one year for that first visitor? That first, that first year. And keep in mind that renewal will be dependent on how well your business is doing. So if you come back to them in a year and show them your tax return and you've made five bucks, they're going to say, uh, Stephen, are you, are you serious about this? And they, depending on how bad it is, they'll either give you like a three month provisional or a six month provisional or a 12 month provisional to get to, to show that you're more serious. And, and this weeds out some people who they just wanted to stay in France. And so they start a fictional business. Um, and the French government will weed you out pretty early on. And, and keep in mind, all they require for viability, strangely, is the minimum wage. So as I say in France, that's roughly 12, 1300 euros a month. So if your business is bringing in 12 or 1300 a month in revenue with a reasonable amount in salary, that's enough for the French government. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the truth. Okay. Um, Great, great, great info. Um, someone just was asking, so kind of the long, the lines of this, do you actually have to leave France when you want to change your visa type? Okay, so this comes down to status. So your residence um, speaks to your status. So for example, if I'm a resident of Japan, I can apply for a visa for France from Japan. I don't have to fly back to the United States to apply because I have status in Japan in order to apply at the French embassy. So when you are applying from the United States as a first time person, you don't have status in France, so you can't apply from France. I can't tell you how many times I'll get a question like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here in France visiting my friends and it's awesome, so I want to apply for a visa. Like you can't apply for a visa in France. You don't have status in France. So when you apply, then you have a visa and you live here. Well, when you live here and you want to renew, you have status here, so you can renew here. The only problem is if you have a non-renewable visa. And I've seen a few people make this mistake. Strangely, it's a bit confusing on the VFS form, but it says, how long would you like to stay? And there's a box that says six to 12 months. And there's another box that says 12 months plus. Strange reason. I don't know why, because it's ambiguous. But if you click the six to 12 months, you're going to get a non-renewable, which has happened to a few people, which has meant they have to go back to the US to get a new visa. But I've helped them through the process of like, don't pack up your whole life. Just pretend you're going on a two-week vacation, make an appointment, go back there, get the visa, come home. Um, so it isn't the end of the world if you end up getting a non-renewable. It just means that you need to click that one year plus if you want to have a renewable. And that's the minimum time period for a renewable. You cannot get a nine-month renewable. You cannot get an 11-month renewable. You can only have a one-year renewable. 
Okay. Makes sense. And then just so everyone knows, you know, a lot of this information is also on Stephen. You have a lot of articles I know regarding this as well, right? Up on your site. Okay. 10, year, 10 years worth of articles. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Whatever you need, you can find it there. Um, okay. So we also had a couple questions regarding online students. So um, one person was curious, it seems like this is excluded from the student visa category, especially if you're not going to a French university. Do you know much about that process for students? You mean, does this person want to go to classes online in France? Because a student visa isn't recognizing that you are a student in life and you want to live in France. It's, I'm going to a French university. Okay, okay. And, th and there are French universities that have online courses, so that's not ruled out. But I want to make it clear, a student visa means you are going to school in France, not that you are a student in life in general and are attending a university outside of France. Like, that has nothing to do with Okay, because that another person was asking, can you take a French class or do you need to enroll in a degree seeking program? So there is a there is a visa classification for learning the French language, but I want to note that those are some of the most expensive courses available in France. Whereas I would argue it would make more sense to take classes in French at a lower level, whether that's about French history or French language or, or French literature, and you'll get two. It'll be much less expensive and you're going to get to have French friends and speak French and learn French um, and it'll be less expensive. But yes, if you have, if you're spending at least 24 hours a week in French study, there's a separate visa just for studying the French language, but it's usually six or six or eight months. It's not renewable. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Makes sense. All right. Um, so another question Let's see, if you get more than a three month tourist visa with a US passport, can you go to visit other European countries without concerns during that time? Okay, so I don't want to be too, too nitpicky about the words here, but I want to be clear. There's, uh, as Americans, we have a visa waiver. So we don't have to get a visa to come to Europe. Soon there, we're going to have um, ESTA or whatever it is, we're going to have to pay money, but it's just a toll booth. So we have a visa waiver. So when someone says tourist visa, you should just say, we have a visa waiver. There's no such thing as a tourist visa to come to, to Europe. So when you're on a visa waiver, it's in Schengen. It's 90 every 180 days. So when you come to France, the clock starts ticking and you have 90 in the next 180 days to be there. If you don't have a visa, you need to leave during the time. And they're only getting more strict and more enforcing about this. And we're talking fines and bans. So you're going to get a fine and then you're going to be banned from the European Union or be banned from France for a certain number of years. Do not overstay your visa. I know it may have been different five years ago or 10 years ago. That is not how it is now. Do not overstay your visa. You're going to get in trouble. In this case, a visa waiver. So if you have a visa status like I do, then yeah, you can, in fact, you could theoretically live somewhere else in Europe if you wanted. Um, but um when you're talking about the 90 days, keep in mind, it's a visa waiver. It's not a visa. A visa is usually something you're going to have to fill out, pay money for, and get a sticker in your passport. That's not what's happening when you come to Europe. You get a visa waiver. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, all right, we had a couple questions regarding income and bank accounts, bank statements, all of that. So one question was regarding getting a visa. Is it based on the income or do you do you have to have that money in the bank before applying for the visa? Like what you exactly? Don't. You, you don't have to, you either need to demonstrate that you have access to um, the minimum wage times the number of months that you're going to be there in the bank. And, and it doesn't even have to be a checking or a savings account. It could be a 401k. Your parents could add you to their E-Trade account. And you're like, oh yeah, I have access to all this money, even though it's not really money, it's just stocks. Uh, the French really don't care. They just, they need to know that you have some kind of means. Or you can demonstrate, as I say, through a remote job that you will be getting X amount per month indefinitely. So you do not have to have a lump sum. However, that is obviously the simplest paperwork wise. You just give them a bank statement. Here's my money. Leave me alone. Otherwise, you're going to have to get a letter from your employer or whatever else. But yeah, that's the simplest. Show them your 401k, show them your savings account, make sure you have more than 1200 euros times 12 in that account. Okay. Got it. Sounds good. Okay. I know we've passed our, our time limit. We've got just a couple more questions. So I'm just going to go through those. And then if for some reason I don't get to yours, um, I've sent, or I'll, I'll include it again, but I've 
put uh, Stephen's contact info in our chat box. So there's lots of different ways you can reach out to him, and I know he'll be more than happy to help. Uh, so we had a couple of questions coming in about French language schools. Do you, I know you mentioned one. Do you have um, you know one for someone that's maybe at the intermediate level that you would recommend? Well, uh, I, you could be a total beginner. That that school that I mentioned, you can be at any level. Um, it's it's an amazing school. And it's residential, obviously. So I, I, I was, I was eating and cooking and sleeping in the same quarters with my classmates. We were, we were there and it was hilarious because we all we came from different backgrounds. So in addition to French at night, there was like Spanish or Russian or Gaelic being spoken um, while we, over dinner. So that, that is one I recommend if you're not interested in, and you can go during the summer and instead of skiing, there's plenty of hiking to do. Um, but if you're interested in general, I would say Alliance Francaise, not just in France, but in the United States, Alliance Francaise has programs everywhere and it's fairly inexpensive. Uh, it's just not going to give you, unless you opt for private tutoring, you're not going to have the private attention that you could normally get in a smaller school, but it's a great place to start. As I say, it's inexpensive. They're solid. I did Alliance Francaise when I first moved to Paris. Had a great time there, so I recommend that strongly. There's other language uh, programs here in Paris, if, if you're interested in Paris. And then there's others all over. Just keep in mind, wherever you are, you're going to adopt that accent. So if you are in the South, then you're going to have that slight Southern accent, Southern French accent, which will be noticed by the snobby Parisians. Go, oh, well, where did you uh, where did you study your French? And uh, you say, oh, well, you know, in the South. And it's like, oh, yes, that, that's I knew. I knew that I could tell I could tell by your accent. Um, so uh, there's lots and lots of options uh, regarding that. But I can't recommend enough residential and in block. So a minimum of two weeks residential, you're going to make leaps and bounds difference. But I, I I say from my own personal experience, I spent a year with a private tutor studying French before I came. And I call it the difference between studying French and learning French. You can study French all you want before you get here, but you're not really going to learn until you're here. And you're in this environment and you're hearing these words every single day, which your English speaking brain rejects as idiotic, right? Because there are noises that are words. <laughs> For example, the number one, right in french it look if you write it down it says un and your english brain wants to go un un it's uh that is how you pronounce the number one in france in french uh and your english speaking brain is like what did, what noise did, did you just make a noise like that's not a word and at some point your brain your your english speaking brain has to turn off and you can only do that when you're hearing french every day and so don't beat yourself up if you're not making a lot of progress studying French in an English speaking country. That's not supposed to happen. But when you get here, you're going to feel like a jolly green giant. You're going to make a lot of progress in a short amount of time because you're hearing it, you're hearing it, you're hearing it, you're hearing it, you're hearing it. Okay. And then another question on that, someone was curious about universities getting, you know, a more graduate degrees. Is there a particular university or just higher level of education you would recommend? Depends on what you want to study. But MBAs are like the new trendy thing in France at the moment. But you have to keep in mind, whatever you want, it's going to cost you like 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever at a lower level, unless you're getting one of these really fancy MBAs and it might cost you, I don't know, like $10,000. But when you're talking about university in, in France, remember, think about a state, not a whole country. So Americans can get used to, okay, it's state tuition. Okay, that makes sense. So, and it's not a residential program. Usually college here is much more of a commuter proposition than it is in the United States. So there's lots of different programs that are available. You'll just have to see which, what interests you because not every, not every city has a program that fits your field of study. Like some places are really known for law or engineering or business. For example, in the Paris region, they're particularly known for their business schools. But you'll have to do some research around that. All right. Sounds good. All right. I love these next questions. We had a couple come in around community um, in France in general. And so, you know, Jim's curious about the social and cultural issues. You know, how easy is it to really meet people there and get to know them, to make friends, find, you know, just find your place to be in the French society? 
Do you know, I feel like this is a recurring question in every country, right? If I were to do a Google search, like how easy is it to find friends in, and then you put in any country you want, Portugal, Japan, um, France, Switzerland, you have to realize, I would argue grosso modo. So in, in large part here in France, they aren't necessarily built for new friends. Uh, French life is very much on a on a on a on a trajectory. You, you go to school, you get a job, you get married or you don't. You have kids, you get a house, etc. It's very much. I know people don't accept this. It's weird, but France French life is very traditional, and so part of that is you already have your friends. You have your friends from school. So the question is like, who are you? What are you? Some guy, some girl from from anywhere. The my French friends, the ones I've I've made over the years generally tend to be, they've either lived or studied abroad, and they're curious about international people. So in a sense, they've made room for people like you. But the average French person, they have a really full life without you. So you're unnecessary to their life, and they shouldn't be penalized. They shouldn't be written about like French people are, are unwelcoming. It's like, they have a totally different way of life than Americans do. We're much more mobile, we're much more likely to, to live in a place that's different from where we were born. We're likely to study in a place that's different from where we were raised. And so for us, making friends is, and you can see it when Americans travel, you know, you'll hear an accent like, hey, are you from, are you from Texas? Yeah, my brother-in-law is from Texas. Hey, buddy. Hey, whatever. French are not like that at all. If a French person hears French being spoken in an airport, they go in the other direction, right? It's the same, it's the same Danish people. They hear Dan Danish being spoken, they go in the other direction. So. Is it easy to make friends? No, but I don't think it's easy to make friends in any culture that's not your own culture. You do not speak the vernacular fluently. You do not have the same cultural norms. And keep in mind, this is the same thing with language. It's gonna take a while for you to understand the cultural references just because you speak the language. I'll, I'll give you an example, a very famous, uh, Nespresso is finally being known in the United States. But for many years, it wasn't. And George Clooney was the face of Nespresso in Europe for years. And there was a very famous publicity campaign in which George Clooney would be in some sort of Nespresso situation. And this gorgeous woman would be coming up. And George Clooney thinks like she's coming up to talk to him. She wants an autograph. And the, the joke always is like she's trying to get to the coffee and like She's just, can you get out of my way, George Clooney? Like, I'm just interested in coffee. And the, it always would end with him saying, what else? Like, of course, like, you wouldn't be interested in me. Like, obviously, it's Nespresso. Like, what else? And so in French, this is quadot. And so when a French person is saying quadot, they're not saying what else. They're making reference to this cultural phenomenon from George Clooney. And so, like, everyone would laugh when you'd say quadot because you're referring to this commercial from like 15 years ago. But if you hear everyone laughing and you don't know why they're laughing, even though you understood the French, it's because you're missing a cultural landmark. Be patient with yourself. It's going to come. But you have to realize when you're missing those sorts of things, it's just harder for you to make friends, to integrate and be patient with yourself. Uh, Americans, we're not patient people. We want things now and we want, th we want things yesterday, frankly, not just now. And so we think that things will be the same and it's never going to be the same in an alien culture as it is in your home culture. In your home culture, you don't have to try. I just want you to think, like, explain to somebody, if someone were to come to the US and you need to explain to them the concept of the DMV, where to find it, what is going to happen to them when they go there? They're gonna be sucked into a pit of despair. You know all of that because you're Americans. And for the non-Americans in this call, it's a pit of hell that I would never wish on you. But you know that. But you come to Europe, you're going to have to learn all of these things. Or if you come to France, there's even more particularities that you'll have to learn about. So be patient with yourself. Yes, it's hard to make friends with French, but they're not any more difficult than um, they're on a spectrum of difficulty. I would say the Swiss are even harder than the French, um, but it's all harder because you're not from there and they don't necessarily have a reason to mix with foreigners, especially if they don't speak English. There's a there's a large number of French people who who don't speak English. Okay, so interesting. Great advice. You just got to be patient, right? Just do your best. Um, okay, I think I have two more questions. I've scrolled through. Hopefully, I've gotten to everyone's. 
Um, again, I probably will not pronounce this correctly, but Cheryl was asking, what about, this is regarding housing, what about the periphery outside of Paris, uh, outside of Paris? Um, is it hard to secure for housing? Don't know if I'm no, saying No, it, it, okay. uh, it's a peripherique or uh, the banlieue, uh, yeah. basically the, the burbs, the suburbs. And I would just look at it the same with an American city. If you're out in the burbs, it's going to be easier than if you're in downtown or if you're in the heart of the city. So um, you're going to get more. You're going to get more for less. You're going to get a bigger apartment and it's going to cost you less money. Speaking for myself, not as not only as someone who adores Paris, but as an American who is moving to France, I thought if I'm going to move to Paris, I'm not going to live in the burbs. Okay, Paris is one of the most amazing cities and there's a special energy that comes from living in the city and not having to take the last train out of the night at 11.45 or midnight and missing out on some great times with friends. So is it a deal breaker? No, but if you really want to live in Paris, live in Paris. Live in a small 64 square feet apartment uh, until you graduate to, uh, sorry, si yeah, si yeah, 64 square feet until you graduate to, to something else and have that experience. And it will always be better than having that bigger apartment out in the burbs. You can always move out there if you want later, but give yourself at least some time in the city. You won't regret it. All right. Great advice. Um, one more question in regards to the visa. If you're traveling, can you bring your 15 year old daughter or son or child, or do they also have to have a separate visa? No, if you're, if they're a child, there's basically a, a sub an aunt an appendix that you're going to add to your application, but no children don't have to go through the same process. Like children are not going to need to show their bank account, <laughs> you know, but you will need to show that you can support them, but they don't, they don't count at the same rate. Uh, and I forget what it is. It might even be something as simple as half of whatever. So you might need to have 150% of the minimum wage in order to support, et cetera. But it's pretty straightforward when you want to add children. It's not complicated. Okay, perfect. Oh my goodness. This has just been a wealth of information. I, I'm blown away. I hope everyone decides to go move to France or somewhere. It'd be quite fun, but you know, it takes a lot of work. So definitely reach out to Stephen if you have any other questions. I think, oh, I go think ahead. or if I, if I could, I just got one, I had it like right after, um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So if you have to go, I understand, but and while, you're doing, and while you're doing that, Stephen, I was going to ask you about the book thing again. So a lot of people wrote in, did you want to do that after, or did you want to do that now? I'll do it. I'll do it right after this final, the final thoughts. Okay. Here. perfect. So you can see, I put Bordeaux in the top left-hand corner. If you like wine, like this is wine country, you get wine jobs, um, but it's a very clubby enclosed place, but it's a two hour train ride up to, to Paris. They have a TGV now there. So a lot, there's quite a few people who live in Bordeaux and they work in Paris. So final thoughts, this will be one of the hardest things you have ever done. I want to be crystal clear about that. I am someone who is a shoot first, ask questions later person. And I tell people all the time that if I had known how hard it was going to be, I may not have done it. Keep in mind, I've just finished the best 10 years of my life in in Europe for a lot of different reasons that would take us a few drinks and like 10 hours to talk about. But it doesn't change the fact that it is, I've been to Marine Corps boot camp, I've run a marathon, like those things pale in comparison to moving to not just, I would argue for anyone who said they moved to Thailand or Australia or wherever else, it's gonna be one of the hardest things you've ever done in your life. I do not wanna downplay that. It's very, very hard. You may face serious opposition to it, even from those who know and love you. As I told you, my family, my friends were not particularly supportive, but in part because I don't think I had done a good job of surfacing that own desire of myself to live in Europe and my particular attachment to France. So it caught them off guard. So it wasn't entirely their fault, but even if they had known, they would have still opposed it, I think. So you're gonna have to go against people who know and love you and possibly. Also don't tie your ego to it. If it doesn't work out, you're still in that 1% of people who tried and who didn't. You're not in the someday, the someday people. You know, They hear about some great experience, they go oh, say someday and they have no intention of even investigating it. The fact that you're even in this call means that you've taken more steps than most people who have ever talked about moving to France have. And if you come and it isn't for you and you go home, hold your head up high, be proud, you are in the 1%. Um, it's not easy to live outside of your home culture. I don't think this can be communicated deeply enough. Living outside your home culture is really hard. And this can be 
difficult for Americans to understand because moving to another state isn't as difficult because they all still speak the same language to an extent and still have some of the same cultural touchstones. But it's really hard to live outside your home culture and outside your home language. Um, and don't so don't feel forever bound to it. In the future, if you want to move, you can. But the standard still is back what how I started this conversation today is, do I love where I live? If not, why not? There is nothing better than waking up in the morning and knowing you are precisely where you are supposed to be. That is one one more thing that can help help you have a great day. And if that's something that isn't correct for you at the moment, it will continue to irritate you. And if you're wondering, why is it that I'm always going on vacation? It's because maybe you're trying to escape from where you live. And that's a problem. I spent all of 2021 in France voluntarily, and I loved it because I love living in this country. Um, I've now spent more time traveling in the last nine months, 11 months than I ever have in my life for different reasons. But if you don't love where you live, I think that's a pretty serious problem. And I think COVID opened the possibility for people to really consider that in a way that they weren't able to prior to 2020. Such a great perspective. I mean, that just solidifies every, this presentation. It was wonderful. You've gotten tons of nice comments. I think you've been extremely helpful for all of us. So thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so for the book, how did you want to go ahead and do that? I'll just say it really quickly. I wrote a book about, it's called 29 Days to France, um, but I wrote it with two other friends um, because they also filled in experiences. One is married to a French guy, one studied abroad here. And so we all had different experiences. And we basically wrote a book of before you move to France, when you move to France, and after you've been here for a year. And each chapter has, has a picture, it has um, questions. And then basically there's a, a there's lines for you to answer. So it functions as a workbook so that if you go through this, this is the book I wish I'd had. This is, I would say, the presentation I wish I'd had prior to moving to France. I didn't know anything about anything. And so um, this book hopefully will help people literally prepare for their move to France by doing exercises, thought exercises will be proposed, um, get, getting things in order, making arrangements. We even, I added a section on how to bring your pet, right? If you have a pet, you have, your pet has to, it doesn't need to get a visa, but they have to have a passport and they have to have their shots. Um, so the book covers stuff that isn't um, covered in my video course. I also have some video courses, but they're on two specific visas, the Proflieb visa and the visitor visa. So all of those things, if you're interested, you can reach out to me. You can write to visas at um, writerly.us or you can write to content at writerly.us and I can try to answer your questions. As I said, there's a giveaway. I'm going to save this chat so I can get all the correct answers and get you guys um, free copies, the ones, ones who got everything. And um, yeah, if there's anything that occurs, you know, we get off, we finish the call today. Ah, this is one thing I wanted to ask Stephen. Please feel free. If it's a reasonable, short question, if it's not something really complicated, I will do my best. Otherwise, I'm happy to do, I do paid consultations usually in 30 minute blocks. If you have a more complicated situation that you'd like to talk about, I'd be happy to do that with you. Perfect, wonderful. Oh my goodness, this was so good. Yes, lots of hand clapping. So thank you so much to all of you also for staying on. I know we went a little bit over the time frame, but I know I wanted to get through all of your questions. And Stephen, thank you for staying on and answering all the questions too. Um, normally at the end of this, I share my screen again and tell you what's coming up. But because we've been on for so long, I'm not going to, but I will just tell you, go to our website, the Nomadic Network, and you can find out everything that we're doing there from in-person meetups that we have coming up, maybe in your area to group tours. We just started those. So those are really fun if you want to meet new people um, in the, around the world. And then every month we have book clubs as well. So check out that site and hopefully we will see you all back here um, at another event. And then maybe in a year from now, Stephen, we should do another one and see who actually moved to France. Yeah, that, that, would, that, awesome. that would be fun for sure. <laughs> And we could all meet up in France. How cool would that be, right? <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming and have a great day wherever you may be. Thanks, everybody.